Do you manage your own IT for distributed teams in Asia? And you know how painful it is. Esavel helps your in-house team by taking cumbersome tasks off their hands and giving them the tools to manage IT effectively. Get help across eight countries in Asia Pacific from on and offboarding, procuring devices to real-time IT support and device management. With our state-of-the-art platform, gain full control of all your IT infrastructure in one place. Our team of IT support pros are keen to help you grow. So check out esevel.com and get a demo today. Use our referral code ASIA for three months free. Terms and conditions apply. Customers don't just want to buy a server, right? They want to buy an outcome. They want something to happen. They want to get business value. And so SSG is Lenovo's pivot to meet our customers where they are and also to lead our company into the future. Because as they have more sophisticated requirements, they need a simple way to manage and deploy all that IT across their organizations. And so when they want that holistic view, providing the services via something which is now SSG, gives them that integrated offering in a single contract, right? And so that they can focus on using their technology in a smarter way. So that's really SSG within the context of Lenovo. And then myself as the technology and delivery officer, I'm really responsible to help think about how new technology can make the experience better. It can make the outcomes better for our customers, as well as then I run the teams that are often because we have managed services that are delivering for customers 24 by 7 all year round. And so the global team of delivery network and experts is also what I run to help bring those outcomes to the customers today. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the premier podcast dedicated to dissecting the pulse of business technology and media in Asia. I'm Bernard Leung, and with the increasing need for hardware, software, and services in the ever complex environment for enterprises to transform digitally, what is the road ahead for IT services with the emergence of AI? With me today, Arthur Hu, Senior Vice President and Chief Information Officer Lenovo, and Chief Technology and Delivery Officer Solutions and Services Group for Lenovo as well, very well-known Chinese multinational group. And of course, very lucky that Art is in Singapore for the F1 race. So welcome to the show, Art. Thank you so much for having me, Bernard. A pleasure. Yes, and this would probably be a very interesting conversation relating to the state of uh, IT services and how the recent emergence of AI is coming, how we're going to transform enterprises digitally. But before we get there, I want to know your origin story because in the process of doing my research on you, I went through a couple of uh, the interviews you have done. So how did you start your career and eventually joined Lenovo that led to your present role? Yeah, this is quite an interesting question, Bernard. I think like some people, I would not have imagined when I graduated from school because I was a computer science engineer uh, by training. And so my role, journey to my current role actually is when I started my career, I joined, I was a management consultant at the beginning of my career at the intersection of business and technology together. And after uh, almost a decade in management consulting, I, I had the opportunity to join Lenovo, right, which has really been working over the past decade and beyond on becoming a, a global technology powerhouse. And so I joined Lenovo to do transformation. And in the last 13 years that I've been at the company, I've really been fortunate that at the same time the company has been doing transformation and tackling progressively larger challenges, uh, I've been able to grow uh, with the organization. And so uh, over the last seven years, I've been the global CIO at Lenovo. And then in addition, within the last half year, I've also taken on leadership in our newest and ex most exciting business group, in my opinion, the solution and services group, which is really around putting together all the hardware and services for customers. And there, in addition to my CIO hat, I'm also the chief technology and delivery officer. So mm. multiple hats, and you did a really good job to get the titles all correct. And, but we're going to get dive a little bit deeper later on the solutions and services group in Lenovo. But just before that, I wanted to ask you, what are the key lessons in your career journey that you can share with my audience who's listening to this show? Yeah, well, I think there's a need to really be open to learning at every step of the way. 
right? and not just when you are starting out. I think being open-minded and looking actively to acquire knowledge, to revisit your frameworks and integrate new facts that are coming has become increasingly important. In fact, you just spoke about uh, generative AI, and I think we'll talk about that more, I'm sure, today. But that's a great example of something that was not on people's radars two or three years ago and is likely going to be something that really is going to change the landscape significantly. So I think there's one aspect which is very much around continuing to learn, uh, continuing to be open and integrate the thinking. Uh, the second one is really around being open to opportunity. Right? Uh, even though I spent most of my career both at uh, McKinsey as a management consultant and now Lenovo, if you look within my career, it's really been a set of decisions every few years where I've been able to take something different, uh, tack or pivot to a different direction. Uh, and so I think strategically saying yes to new opportunities and not being necessarily so focused at the outset, because you don't know what opportunities life and career will bring to you, and you have to be bold enough uh, to take a risk uh, sometimes on yourself. And it doesn't always work. But I think if you can learn from it, that's always beneficial. And then the, the last part is really when you're when you start leading teams, uh, it is important uh, to really have a good view of what the real situation is. And what I mean by that is it's been very important to have your ear to the ground, no matter uh, if you are an individual contributor, because I joined Lenovo as just an individual contributor, I had zero people reporting to me. And I think what that's always given me is an appreciation for is no matter if you are leading just yourself or if you're leading a team of hundreds or even thousands, it's really important to keep in mind and understand what is actually happening and not to get far away from the source of the market and the business and your customers. Mm. Just as a thought, is it actually much more difficult now because people have gone into what I call the hybrid working environment? For example, you might have some colleagues remotely in other parts of the world or it's still business as usual. Nothing has really changed that much. Yeah, I think there's both sides of it. Obviously, this is a discussion that's still playing itself out now. Uh, and I think the companies that have struggled most are the ones have, who have tried to pretend nothing has changed right? and to say, just keep as is and pretend the pandemic never happened. Uh, I think it's an opportunity. I think, it's, I think it only is difficult if you come in with a fixed mindset, I've, I just want to go back to the way that it used to be. And I think companies that take too much that kind of approach uh, will find that it does not resonate and they may begin to lose some of their employees. I think if you're open to the conversation and you talk about what it is you believe in and why you take certain actions, for example, Bernard, right, we, we try not to say just be back in the office because, but we start out with two things. I think we state what the intention and what our core beliefs are. And then we communicate openly with the teams about that. So for example, even within Lenovo at our executive committee, we had an extended conversation and also did surveys with the employees of, okay, Lenovo employees around the world, do you believe in the value of human contact face-to-face? -face? And everyone right, so raises yes, mm. right? Everyone loves to see their friends, to see colleagues from a long time ago. And from that point, we can, by opening communicating with our employees, then it's much more natural path. Because if people believe that you, we are humans and we have value in face-to-face -face connection, then it's a question of how. Right? And then you can have a more open discussion of, well, what shape would this take? How do we design thoughtful interactions? How do we re-engineer our offices for meaningful interactions that people get excited to come to the office for? And that way, by communicating and talking about what is the shared goal, we're able to much better bring the employees along. Because then it's not, oh, well, the chairman said everyone back into the office just because he said so. It's much more, oh, we all agreed. Yes, we do like seeing colleagues occasionally. These are the types of reasons we like to see colleagues. And then bringing in the support, right? We've actually rebuilt many of our offices so that they have much more shared spaces. We've set norms that we uh, bring people in to have meaningful interactions and not everyone is just in their cube doing a Zoom meeting. And so there's nothing that's perfect, but um, it was a bit of a longer answer, Bernard. But I think companies that try to or something of just the way it was without acknowledging how the circumstances have changed struggle, right? And we've tried to take a much more human-centric approach. Mm. That's a very thoughtful response and also how you are bringing the perspectives. And I think even for myself, um, trying to do everything over Zoom is not the solution. I'd rather actually even go out and meet people, have a coffee and, you know, have that face-to-face -face interaction, something that we missed during those years of pandemic, which comes to the main subject of the day. I want to talk about Lenovo and also the future of IT services and AI. But first, I do know as a Chinese myself, from, as a Chinese Singaporean myself, 
Can you give our audience an overview of Lenovo, its goals and its vision and mission? And I do know Lenovo is known to Chinese as Lian Xiang. Yes, of course. So Bernard, I think uh, it's a great question. And it's not as obvious as you might expect, because Lenovo, as I mentioned, even in the time that I've been, has changed significantly. Briefly, we are now a really global technology leader, and we have over 35 years of experience in powering customers through our devices. Right, That is our heritage, and we are very proud of it. For example, many of uh, your listeners will know about uh, ThinkPad, right, which is one of our premier brands. Our mission now is smarter technology for all. And what we really mean by that is we believe fundamentally in the power of computing to build a brighter and more sustainable future. And not just for our customers, but this is because for uh, the missions that we undertake with our customers, for the colleagues, our communities, and even the planet. And we really strive to become one of the world's great personal technology companies. And that actually, this mission is also leading us into the foundation for why we now have the Lenovo Solutions and Services Group, of which I'm also a part, because Lenovo is now trying to pivot from what people maybe historically know us as, of, oh, yeah, you guys have ThinkPads, but what people don't know often, and I'm talking even, uh, Bernard, even if you or I were to go to one of the hawker stands and ask people, they say, oh, yeah, Lenovo has PCs, but they don't know that we have edge servers, that we have servers, and we have supercomputers, that we have solutions and services and phones, right? They're shocked. Uh, And so Lenovo is not the same company that it was 10 years ago. We've really evolved, and we're really leaning into services to bring the best of the company to our customers. Mm, totally correct. I think if unless you're really involved in the enterprise side, which I always know that the Lenovo is now more than just trying to get laptops on that. I want to really, since you talk about the solutions and services group as a really emerging business within the group itself, can you dive a little bit deeper on the function of the solution and services group, which I'm going to now short form it as SSG and yeah. describe your specific responsibilities within that division. Yes, absolutely. So thank you, Bernard, for saving me some syllables. SSG for the listeners is also a little bit easier than solution and services. So Lenovo is easiest to think about as having three main planks of the business. The first one is called our intelligent devices. And that's all the things that you think about as client computing. So this has our Motorola Mobility Group, our smartphones. This also has our tablets, our pads, our ThinkPads, our PCs, our workstations. So all of the client computing that you would imagine in your home or an office setting. Then we have the intelligent or the infrastructure solutions group, ISG. uh, And that is all about the servers, right? We have uh, networking, computing, and storage that are all the things that a CIO needs to go power a company and also Uh, public clouds used in order to provide cloud services that are now so famous. On top of this, these two, we then have across both IDG, the devices, as well as the ISG, the infrastructure solutions, is the SSG team. And that really is the connective tissue across our end-to-end technology offerings. We like to call all the hardware that I just spoke about, we have the best pocket to cloud. Right? Because something as small as my uh, Motorola Razor that fits in my pocket, all the way to the biggest servers that go into the cloud, we have the industry's best technology. And so SSG, by providing, but now the fundamental motivation is customers don't just want to buy a server, right? They want to buy an outcome. They want something to happen. They want to get business value. And so SSG is Lenovo's pivot to meet our customers where they are and also to lead our company into the future. Because as they have more sophisticated requirements, they need a simple way to manage and deploy all that IT across their organizations. And so when they want that holistic view, providing the services via something which is now SSG gives them that integrated offering in a single contract. And so that they can focus on using their technology in a smarter way. So that's really SSG within the context of Lenovo. And then myself, as the technology and delivery officer, I'm really responsible to help think about how new technology can make the experience better. It can make the outcomes better for our customers, as well as then I run the teams that are often, because we have managed services that are delivering for customers 24 by 7, all year round. And so the global team of delivery network and experts is also what I run to help bring those outcomes to the customers today. 
you also have that unique position of holding also the CIO and the CDTO title. So how do you differentiate these two roles? And I mean, I think my question is more on how do you manage the demands of both these roles? I think it's a pretty demanding uh, responsibility because there's a lot in the solutions and services side and also managing the sort of the policy, the governance of the Lenovo group itself. Yeah, th- this is actually quite an interesting question um, because I wear the two hats. So I'll talk about what's different about them, but also the bridge between them that makes it possible. So the CIO role, as you know, is really about uh, building all the technology that enables Lenovo's operations. Right. So these are the things that uh, help us close our books, the software that runs our factories, our e-commerce sites, our user forums, any technology uh, that Lenovo uses to run as a company is what I build as the CIO. Now, in addition, then the technology and delivery is really about being with our customers. Right? What, C- what differenti- differentiates the CIO role is that it, my, my customer is Lenovo, right? the mm-hmm. Lenovo executives, Lenovo business leaders, and our business presidents. In my role in SSG, being the technology and delivery officer, right, that is all external. Right? And so it's about how do I provide IT services that we offer and sell contractually to those group of users and customers. The bridge that makes this possible is because, as what I said, actually, if I think of the CIO role, it's actually delivering all these services, applications, uh, end user, help desk, infrastructure, private cloud, public cloud. I'm delivering those services as CIO to Lenovo. And as the technology and delivery officer for SSG, I'm delivering that for all other customers. But by and large, those are the same services, right? When Lenovo needs the same exact IT services to run as any other customer, right? You have users that need a help desk, right? you have business applications that need development, you have infrastructure, both public and private cloud that you need managing. And so that was the insight when we had the executive discussions, right? This actually led to the discussion of, well, what if we actually had IT right, in my CIO role become a part of SSG so that we can continue to serve Lenovo as our biggest and largest customer. But let's take that mindset and expertise and also use that as the seed to quickly scale up and start serving external customers as well. And so even though absolutely it is a lot of work, right? I think what really helps be the bridge here is that I've had a decade of experience and more in delivering IT services, right? And what's different, but what is different then is shifting the mindset and the team's mindset to say, well, we have to serve not just a single customer, but we now have to build a platform to be able to serve multiple customers around the world. Right? So there's both similarity and difference. And what I've the biggest change for me that's been really interesting is that there's a lot more time spent with our users and our customers. And that actually brings a lot of insights on how I can improve the organization, both in SSG, but also for Lenovo. Mm. And I think it's very interesting you said, you know, Lenovo is the internal customer, extends to the external customer, taking the learnings, taking the best practices out for the external customer. So I'm sort of very curious, like how do customers benefit from the services for the SSG and how does actually Lenovo approach problem solving for this group of customers? I, I assume that these group of customers are enterprises, very large enterprises, very similar, maybe uh, uh, multinational, even regional enterprises as well. Yeah. So let me give, I think in terms of who we're serving, and as I said earlier, this is really customers are often asking us, right? Because it's a very good question. And I think we can take a market-oriented view to this. The reason mm-hmm. we get pulled into this is customers often, it starts with Lenovo, for example, I was just talking to another CIO uh, who had recently started buying Lenovo servers and was amazed. He said, wow, your servers almost never go down compared to some of the competition. Right. And because he now trusts Lenovo hardware, he says, well, I have all these other things that I need to manage. Right. Can you help me manage and scale up around my cloud management? Uh, and so uh, in that case, it's really a discussion with the customer where they have a need. They often say, well, look, more and more because technology is a complicated landscape. It's not just SSG wants to provide that integration or glue across solutions. Customers want it, right? Because customers in general, and I speak here as a CIO, as a CIO, I don't. I would prefer several trusted partners rather than having to work across a hundred partners who stitch together little point solutions. Uh, and so that same dynamic as my C, as for in my CIO role is what CIOs in the industry are bringing. 
Uh, and so in terms of who benefits from what SSG provides to the market, with solutions like our device as a service and our true scale, where we can take any of our solutions and make them uh, as a service model, uh, we're providing customers more flexibility and we're providing them integrations so that when they have a complex infrastructure environment, we can simplify, right? They, we can provide the, and provision the hardware, we can maintain it, we can support it, right? We can dispose of it at the end of the life cycle. And so what we're really trying to do is give those kind of outcomes and simplify the management of their infrastructure landscape in a better way. And that's exactly the same way about how we solve problem solving. It really starts with listening, right? It's just, and this is also, Bernard, you touched on something that's quite pivotal for Lenovo's transformation. If you're just selling hardware, then it's really, you know, hey, here's, I have a piece of hardware, I have a server, I have a workstation, let me sell to you, and it does a particular thing. But as we get into services, then we really have to listen, right? We have to become even more engaged with the customers to understand what is their context. And from there, it's much more of a collaborative discussion about really drawing out what customers are looking for. Because sometimes customers themselves are only able to articulate a little bit. And then as you go into the dialogue with them, then they can really sharpen what it is they're looking for. Let me give you an example. We were talking with a large bank recently where I was speaking with uh, the lead, their, their CTO right, in charge of all the technology. Uh, and so th their problem was, right? They, originally, we thought they just wanted to buy some more computers. right? But then once I got into the meeting with the CTO, the discussion actually turned into, well, we're actually not that satisfied with our entire end-user computing architecture. right? They had invested a lot in the virtual desktop VDI, right, a lightweight solution. And they were having some questions about the return on investment and if they wanted it to be a long-term model. right? So what started as, uh, and in traditionally, maybe in the old ways, maybe five years ago, Lenovo would have said, well, here, let me sell you some more uh, computers. Uh, this way, it turned into a discussion that said, well, maybe you don't need more computers. What you, it sounds like you need actually is to have a better understanding of both where your organization is going, but what's changing about and user computing architectures, especially with generative AI. And so rather than sell you anything right now, well, why don't we show, well, let's have a workshop to discuss where things are going, right? Let's understand why your uh, VDI uh, is not working so well and what are some options if you want to re-architect. And from there, we can talk about the various offerings uh, that have uh, Lenovo could provide. Uh, and so I think that's a really, it was really interesting because five years ago, we would have just tried to say, you know, forget your problem. We're just going to sell you some computers. And now it's a much more chance to, really engage the customers in the dialogue. And I think they appreciate that, right? Mm -hmm. Because they need thought partners, they need someone to help them make sense of an increasingly complex landscape. Mm. So maybe we just drill down to some concrete example. Can you talk about some of your notable success stories from the SSG group in the Asia Pacific? Yeah, no, and Asia Pacific is, is absolutely one of our uh, key geographies, right? I think it's extremely dynamic uh, as a region, right? As you know, because Asia Pacific is just, it's just an umbrella term. It includes such diversity, both geographically, culturally, country-wise. And so, and I think increasingly, there's a lot of dynamism that's generating innovation. So, you know, just to pick a couple of examples from recent wins that we've had, we've partnered and you know we'll get you more detail as needed offline, but we've partnered with what's called Tama University. And here, they used one of our infrastructure offerings, which is around hyper-converged solutions. Uh, and there, they were really scaling up for them. Uh, we, I know we just talked about virtual desktop in another example, but here they were, they were leaning into and they had uh, reasons to use virtual desktop infrastructure to support a growing student body, right? And hyper-converged using, uh, in this case, it's a bit technical, our Think Agile VX series, but it's a series that's in words hyper-converged, provided the flexibility and the best cost to be able to have flexibility to support that growing student body, because this resilience and the nature and the ability to grow with uh, your demand, in this case, the student body was important, right? We've also recently worked uh, with a leading Indian uh, bank, Right, which again uses our, I think, agile hyper-converged infrastructure. And for them, it wasn't about scalability. For them, they were having challenges about both the reliability and the performance. And so by getting deep into uh, the banking use case there of their computing workload, we were able to significantly uh, increase the performance and reliability. Right? And it's not just uh, businesses. Right, We've also worked with the government here to think about how to use 
our infrastructure technology to actually increase digital citizen access to government services. Right? And so that's another angle outside of the world of pure business where we're able mm. to uh, bring technology right, and have digitalization maybe outside of the enterprise context. So I think a lot mm. of people think enterprise context and you hear about uh, technology companies. Uh, but right, on a day-to-day -day life, when, when you can actually increase civic participation and make uh, accessing uh, services easier for uh, citizens, right, that's also quite positive as well. And so I, I think there's quite a, a few areas where I think we're starting with very specific understanding of customer problems, we're able to uh, have quite a good impact. Mm. So what is the one thing you know about Lenovo SSG that not many people do? I think the, the main thing here is people don't understand how global we are. Because right? as I said, and it's, it's one of the things that I work to change all the time, mm. which is that we do this, but people don't realize that Lenovo, we have a global network. Right? We can help you deliver wherever you are across more than 100 countries, whatever your needs are. Right? Because I think people have a very narrow conception from you know, history of what Lenovo is. And the main thing they don't know is that we do and offer solutions and services, and we have skills, we have all the skills in countries around the world, right? and we also partner. So that's what people don't recognize. They think, oh, I just buy hardware, but SSG really brings Lenovo's global scale to services in a way that I think people are not aware of. So I want to pivot the conversation as we have talked about the Lenovo SSG. I think we want to talk about general trends and thinking about uh, how generative AI is going to change the landscape, even in the IT services space. So the first is, I think there's a Lenovo global study of CIOs, I think 2023. I think one of the emphasis was on ESG and it's just a novel area of focus for CIOs. I think the first question I probably want to think about is how is Lenovo utilizing technology to champion sustainability specific to the Asia Pacific region, given its large manufacturing and agriculture or other kind of needs. I think scope three emissions is one of probably the bigger pieces yeah. of that. So what is the Lenovo's point of view in ESG? Yeah, so it's it, this is actually one of our key pillars of the strategy and it has been, right? I think we more uh, had this in different forms. It's really crystallized under ESG. And so from the beginning, from the very heart of our strategy and from the top down, we included it as one of the key pillars. Uh, from an IT perspective and a CIO, it's quite interesting because uh, in our survey, we also found CIOs are taking on many more kind of non-CIO-like responsibilities. And I think it's happening because technology is really getting deeper into all parts of the business. What, what I would say here is from a Lenovo perspective, this is actually, if we start with the specifics, it's all throughout, if we think about the uh, environmental part right, and actually reducing carbon throughout the life cycle, this is the perfect interaction where doing good and doing well, right? they really align perfectly. Uh, because typically, if you want to have fewer carbon emissions, it's things like we will look at our manufacturing processes, right? Uh, how can, what's the solder that we're using to put things together? How can we have a lower carbon uh, manufacturing process? How can we use uh, the lowest foot carbon footprint packaging, right? How can we actually schedule and manage logistics so that it's highly efficient and we have fewer container loads, fewer truck loads, right? Faster. Mm -hmm. And we find, so every step of the way, and for example, we also build in, we have a lot of technology around data centers. One of the big topics is, oh boy, mm -hmm. right? All these data centers, and especially now for the next generation with all this uh, generative AI compute, it's going to be really energy dense. Right? And so how do we bring new cooling technologies? We have uh, liquid cooling technology that's really leading as well that allow us to be much more efficient about energy use. So from the way our devices are designed to use and be energy efficient to every step of our manufacturing and delivery and customer service value chain, right, we are investing to make sure we are minimizing the carbon footprint and that is contributing significantly. From the other perspective as the CIO, because it's not enough to just do these things, everyone wants visibility. And so visibility means you have to instrument all these processes. You have to then be able to have the data operations to extract the data, uh, transform it, and then visualize it and integrate it in a way that's meaningful for the business. And so beyond just supporting all these operations happening, we have to make sure that the data visualization and integration happens as well. Right? And so I think there's multiple levels that CIOs are contributing both to support the, the actual work uh, of enabling 
reduction, and then for both the environmental and the sustainability aspects. And then it really goes into the governance aspect. If we think about ESG, mm. governance only happens when you have something to govern. Right? And typically that mm. means you have to have the scorecards, right? you have to have the visibility, you have to have some notion of real time to be able to act on the data appropriately. And so I think for CIOs, it's an amazing time because mm. I, I get asked all the time, how can right, how do we get better visibility? How can we measure the data better? And people uh, are much more collaborative because then I think it opens the pathway to these partnerships with other business teams and also external and ecosystem players as well. Mm. How do you think about, like, say, the Lenovo Green Initiatives has helped the clientele to align, I think, I guess, with the rising demand of tech solutions that benefit society? I think as a former CIO myself, I think about, like, whether the data centers are green as part of the ESG governance reporting or even think about like whether how do we recycle the laptops that we have. In fact, we are also a learnable customer as well from that point of view. Ah, well, thank you. Thank you. I hope we kept you happy in your former job. But yeah, I, I think the life cycle is definitely what you spoke about is definitely uh, a key part, right? To make sure because we actually have consulting and services, not only that you can offset CO2, but we can help you manage your device footprint over time to minimize the carbon generation. And we can also help on the device disposal at the end of the life cycle uh, and help on reuse as well. And so I think that's one dimension. I, I think the other part of this is really helping customers understand that our devices, again, all from the pocket to the data center and everything in between, TrueScale, which is our brand for mm. everything as a service, this is really going to help uh, simplify, right? Because what, what, I mean, let me use Lenovo ourselves as an example. Right? If we think about being more green, it's important to have less waste, right? It's important to know where all your devices are, and it's important to manage the life cycle so you don't end up improperly disposing of things. But customers often don't do those things well, right? You end up with people that don't track their assets as closely. Right? You have stock rooms that are full of old laptops because right, the department administrator didn't know what to do with them. And so one of the things that we found is actually a key value driver when we have discussions with our customers uh, about TrueScale is that they really like the simplicity and the visibility because then we can say, hey, look, here's what you were doing. Right? You were actually having you know, 5 7% of devices that were improperly disposed of or never disposed of. Right? And so that was just waste. And that's opportunity for you both on a from a value perspective as well as from a reducing carbon emissions and helping with waste disposal and e-waste recycling. Uh, by having uh, TrueScale, where we manage the end-to-end -end life cycle, we're often able to help customers capture these opportunities. Right? Not because they weren't thinking about it, but because they just didn't have the end-to-end -end view to, to be able to act on the intelligence. And so I think that's really important, which is how do we provide services that give that visibility to the customer? And with the visibility, we can then show to them how for their computing requirements that they are being as optimize as they can be, right? Not over-purchasing, not under-purchasing, and then making sure they're managing the life cycle. I think what drives this, and as you know, be, uh, from, from your CIO career, Bernard, is compute is going to be at the heart of everything, and even more so, right? So it's only going to it's only going to go up. And the service mm -hmm. is then about how you can optimize that, I think, is a key part of being able to uh, have the data to then show the story, right? Because I think what we're going to see in ESG, like you said, scope three emissions is a huge topic. How do we actually get science-based targets that are backed by data? And so ultimately, I think anything that, and that's what we're doing with our services around sustainability consulting, right? all of our programs, we need to be able to show customers how they can take, how they can also take the data and fit into their sustainability stories as well. And that's something that customers are definitely very interested in. As we gaze into the horizon, I guess, what potential hurdles and prospects do you anticipate for Lenovo and also the wider tech sector in the Asia Pacific then? Yeah, this is always fascinating because I think they're really kind of the flip sides of the same coin, right? I mm. think uh, you already touched upon it. Uh, Asia Pacific is such a, a broad region. Uh, and I, I think the global challenges that are also applicable in Asia Pacific because it's so diverse is that uh, it's just a highly competitive uh, landscape. I, I think one of the trends and one of the open questions now that's playing out is, well, what will happen with all the data sovereignty regulations? Right? Mm. I think even before generative AI, uh, many countries uh, are actually strengthening uh, data residency laws. Right? They're protecting their data about citizens and sensitive infrastructure and other assets. Right? And so if you can, you can imagine a future where every country, right, even the extreme example said, Right, no data can leave the, the borders of this country. 
right? And of course, mm. that's highly secure, but that's also very complex. And that's counter to the trend of globalization that has been happening. And so if it continues to go down that extreme, that can incur a lot of complexity and cost. And then ultimately, because a lot of the training data is around sharing and getting larger data sets that can be used, that could have some interactions there. Obviously, the, the risks around data security, but just security in general, because the threat landscape continues to evolve, right? Companies need to be very thoughtful about how do they protect themselves because you, know, you see a lot of breaches, unfortunately, where often secrets and data get are leaked uh, or things like ransomware, which are just destructive. Right? And so I think those continue to be challenges. Uh, at the same time, though, I, I think the challenges also bring opportunity because it's such a big trend. Whenever there's a big shift that might be happening, in this case, uh, let's take, for example, data localization. You also see a lot of innovation ecosystems springing up around that, right? I think the in investment, if you look at uh, funding, both from angel and venture capital, that's going into generative AI that continues to go into cybersecurity, that goes into solutions about how to comply with data localization laws, right? How do we actually architect systems that actually is a byproduct, right? You see a lot of custom, you see a lot of startups that are coming up. Uh, in China, India, South Korea, Singapore that are looking into these areas because customers are responding to the governments. They're responding to regulations as responsible uh, stakeholders. So even though that is in some sense going to potentially increase complexity, but to manage that, uh, technology is also and can be and should be part of the solution. And ultimately, mm -hmm. I think digital transformation, because there are still so many countries uh, where the digitalization index in general is still relatively low, right? We've been talking about tra digital transformation for a while, uh, but there's still many industries that are still relatively early uh, in this transformation. And so I think that's going to be a continued source of underlying demand, right? The future is unlikely to be less digital, right? I don't see many companies or governments or entities saying, yeah, we should have less access and we should de-invest in technology. Uh, I think it'll be more, right? And I think especially in Asia Pacific, because there's, again, from a services and manufacturing perspective, it's got a lot of uh, tailwinds uh, that are supporting it. Right? I think that will continue to drive uh, demand as well as appetite for transformation. Mm. With the ID services domain undergoing rapid changes and data as a service and cloud solutions are predicted to experience significant growth by 2025. I think what sectors in the Asia Pacific would you believe that is pretty well equipped to thrive? I mean, despite we have challenges like inflation and talent gaps in the region itself. Yeah, I want to first say a, a short uh, comment around talent gaps, right? Mm. Uh, I, I think sometimes it is overplayed perhaps relative to what we see in the media, right? Uh, because I think the nature of technology, uh, because it is growing, I think it's actually an opportunity, right? By definition, uh, you, you basically had very few people who were skilled in generative AI two years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So, but now that it has really emerged on the scene, is that a talent gap? I think it's just an opportunity, right? Because it just emerged uh, and it's a gap implies that almost something like there, it's a persistent gap that's very hard to close. Whereas in my experience, if a company and you are very committed and applied and, and build the pathways to learn by doing, right, to learn by putting things into production and experimenting, you can actually, through a combination of smart hiring and practice, you can actually mm. provide and, and get the skills that you need. Right. But back to your question, Bernard, I think E-commerce and digital payments, because those are so, so core to the infrastructure of uh, countries, even those as a part of making uh, services uh, more accessible, uh, those will continue to uh, be areas of investment. Uh, with generative AI, there's really an opportunity to reimagine the delivery of many services. And I think that's going to be, that's part of the reason for the excitement with AI and uh, with traditional analytical AI, but now with generative AI as well. There are a lot of large companies in Asia Pacific that are positioned to be key players because, again, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of insight that comes from all of these behaviors and all of the dynamism that is in the AP region. One of the things that you do is driving digital transformation and change across um, different enterprises. So do you have any words of wisdom for emerging tech leaders or even pioneers in the region on how to drive change through tech? 
Yeah. So I, we talked about uh, learning. So we can go quickly past that one. A few things as well, then given the trends of the future, I think uh, the first one is really about the collaboration and networking. And they, of course, social is a part of that. But I think uh, technology leadership now more and more is, is not only about understanding new tech, but it's about figuring out how to connect the dots, right? There are so many pieces that you can put together uh, that I think a lot of the value really lies at the intersection between where technologies uh, should work together, but don't work together as well today. Uh, and then how do you stitch that into uh, a vision, right? And so I think this uh, increasing the collaboration and networking will help this integration of technology because most people are not going to be technology experts. They don't, and they don't need to, they should not need to understand the technical details uh, of how steering uh, large language models should work as an example. Uh, but then it is important to be able to fit these ideas together uh, so that they make sense for people who are not deeply versed in technology, but they want to understand what does it mean for them? Right? So I think the integration of technology is important. I think the second part is to continue to lean into staying close with customers and having a user-centric design. Right? And I think startups tend to be very good about this. And I think enterprises have a big opportunity here, which is to continue to uh, have the mechanism to get feedback quickly uh, from the users, because ultimately that's going to be a huge part of can you reduce friction and increase the value of what it is that the technology that you're delivering. And then I think the third and final thing here, just not, not because I think probably you all have a long list, but I've noticed the power of people who are really able to evangelize and I would say just demystify the technology, right? That's because people, especially with uh, something like generative AI, uh, it can be kind of nervousness inducing, right? Because now it's saying it can do it can do 50% of 50 people's job or 50% of 50% of the jobs, right? Of the work in half of the roles, right? And so you see a lot of claims about how wide reaching this is going to be. And then many people may just think, oh, am I going to lose my job? And so I think it's really important to, in some sense, step up from just a technologist and to be kind of a technology evangelist and have that ability as well to be the bridge with the business users, your customers, or just society at large about helping people understand what technology can and should be used for, right? Because I think that's mm -hmm. really, you don't want people to be nervous about it. You want to provide the simplicity uh, and understand enough understanding so people have a handle with which to grab onto and to engage with it in a productive way versus saying, oh, that sounds scary. I don't like it. Mm. It, it reminds me of recently, like, there was this very good emerging market study about those gig workers who goes to Upwork sites to do projects for others on the other side of the world. And then what happens was they thought that it used to be an icon designer should be out of job because of generative AI. And then they showed up now as prompt engineers for generative AI. So that how fast the world has adapted, as you rightfully pointed out in that conversation about talent gap. That gap is actually a more of a misnomer than what how people is learning to adapt as such. I want to get to the most exciting part, which is AI. So I, I think you are definitely no stranger that recent advances in AI, specifically ChatGPT and generative AI. Where do you see the most opportunities for businesses and enterprises? Yeah. So I would break this into two horizons. And, and the second will have a, a kind of a, a less granular answer. But the first horizon, which is where we are now, is it? I think we should recognize we are very early uh, in the generative AI adoption uh, curve. and Because this may and will continue to play out over years and even decades. And I think the first wave of what are the promising opportunities for businesses is really around a couple of areas. One is around customer experience, uh, because I think typically people who use chatbots, right, the, the, the major mode right now uh, is around helping improve the uh, the customer service and chat experience. Right? And so I think that's an area where with more natural language interactions, customers can get better service and feel better about the interaction they've had. Uh, secondly, right, I think it really helps with the efficiency, right? Because I think mm. uh, writing a first draft, summarizing an article or summarizing a meeting, right, I think those are things that are actually giving significant improvements uh, in how quickly people can do things. Uh, and the third one is really effectiveness, right? I think it's not just doing the same things better, but it's actually giving people additional capabilities, right? So that, just like you said, in the past, maybe you were just uh, typing answers into, you were a support agent, 
who was uh, just typing answers to someone who had a question. But now, right, uh, actually, you're actually a, a prompt engineer who's helping manage knowledge and train the bot for the future, right, or helping better improve and guide how this can work. And so I think that's a good example of people can also shift to focusing on higher value activities that have more creativity and problem solving. So that's kind of wave one, right? Where you see companies, mm -hmm. and that's just for text, right? There's also modes around sound and video and code as well. And so I think on all those fronts, it's going to be experience and speed and, and effectiveness. Now, and I think that can easily go on for a couple of years because companies still need to work out a lot of uh, questions. And there's a lot, there's so much change on the technology side as well. So I think this will be quite exciting for a while. What will start to emerge in the second wave is are, are things that we may not even really know so much about today, right? It's, it's almost like we're climbing the first mountain. And as we get towards the summit of the first mountain, we will probably see additional mountains in the future. Uh, but this is where I think, uh, you know, after a few years, it's going to really help unlock the human potential, right? Uh, because uh, it'd be moving beyond what we can do today. The first application of technology is what we apply to the existing modalities. Uh, but uh, in the future, if it really gets there, right, uh, I, I think there's a second horizon uh, which may start to emerge uh, once we start capturing most of the uh, more of the opportunity from some of the first horizon uh, uh, mm -hmm. dimensions that I just spoke about. Do you think like the applications for AI, specifically, let's say I'm targeting enterprise, is going to be within the first wave as you described it, or is it maybe comes true in the second horizon at that beginning stage? Well, I think for companies, the good news is that they should be able to get value uh, at, at all phases, right? And mm. it may not be as clear as first or second horizon because th these mm. things, right, they, they, they tend to take place and suddenly it's upon you. But what I, I think, because it actually can power kind of the exponential growth, right? I had a friend who made a comment that said, having uh, something like uh, these large language models feels like having 100 assistants and 100 analysts real time able to produce any uh, basic analysis. And it's quite powerful, right? And right, just it, like, it's, it's hard to say what you can even do with that, because at this point, we're almost limited by our imagination of how the world is now. And so I think that's probably what's most exciting. But for enterprises, because there are so many areas we can apply it, I think the good news also is in the past seven or eight years, just I think Lenovo is a good example. We've gone down this journey for analytical AI, machine learning, deep learning, right? those techniques, we already have a framework of what it's like to try and experiment. How do we introduce analytical AI into all parts of the company and all parts of the value chain? And so we're able to extend that framework. So I think when we remind people that actually we've taken similar journeys before, or at least we have some muscles in place to help manage the change. That also helps people, A, make them more comfortable, and then it also makes them more confident that they can look out for uh, the paths to value and how they can actually capture that in the journey. Mm. And then because I think you just mentioned how Lenovo does it internally, integrating AI into, its, into the analytical portion and then try to do the change within. But how does Lenovo view AI and how is the company assisting its clients to navigate that, this new yeah. generative AI era? Yeah. So because of our partnerships, we get a lot of early access and previews with the largest partners, right? NVIDIA, Microsoft, right? And so mm. what I just said about how we are navigating our own journey is actually exactly the conversation we have with customers, right? Where we view AI as the tool, which is fundamentally about the augmented intelligence. It's about unlocking human capabilities, and it's not something that it's being done to us, right? So first of all, it's very much about an empowering experience. And I think customers find that narrative uh, to be one that they buy into. And so when we help customers, it's really about uh, demystifying it. It's really about understanding where their challenges are, and then it's helping them get started. Right? I would say we're lucky because of our partnerships and our global scale, we get a lot of early access. And so we're able to help enterprises navigate the journey. Right? What, what should my large language models stack look like? Right? How do I actually get started on retraining some of my people? How do we show and educate the executive team about how to think about uh, generative AI. And so we're helping clients utilize AI first by understanding it. And then because we have AI powered solutions, all of our solutions are, right, for example, our uh, ISG, our infrastructure solutions. We have AI powered edge servers, we have AI powered uh, cloud servers. And so 
we have these AI powered solutions that they can also take to their specific needs. So for our customers, it's one, having the conversation so that we can triangulate on where their interest is. And then it's by showing them, well, here's what we've done. See if this is helpful for you. And we've got all these building blocks that you can use, right? We have pre-built partial solutions. We have uh, what we call building blocks within Lenovo uh, that we've used and we think our customers can use through TrueScale uh, to also deploy in their environment to get their outcomes that they're looking for. Mm. Our traditional closing question, what does grid look like for Lenovo SSG in the coming decade? So I think the aspiration and what great looks like is that when in the next decade, if you and I, right, and we were to walk around Singapore uh, or just go to a business conference uh, in 10 years from now, that we could go around and everyone would know that Lenovo is a services leader, right? That we're able to take this wonderful computing capability we have and that we are a preferred provider that people think of as, oh, right, Lenovo can help us solve that because they have the computing, they have the expertise, they have the global scale and the skills to deliver that to us. So that's probably my first top level answer. And then in addition, I would also say around ESG that uh, right, we've announced that uh, we scope one, two, and three emissions that are approved by the Science-Based Targets Initiative. In 10 years, I would like to say that we are on track uh, for the scope one and two, and that we've made significant sco- uh, progress on the scope three emissions. Many thanks for coming on the show. And I really benefited from this conversation with you and hearing you sharing what Lenovo is now focusing on ESG and in the age of AI as well. So in closing, I have two very quick questions. Any recommendations that have inspired you recently? Yeah, again, and I, I do a lot of I, I do a lot of reading and not just of technology books as well. Cause I think as I spoke about, I think integration from different fields is actually a big part of connecting the dots. And so I have maybe two book recommendations that I found interesting that I could share with your readers. One of them is called The Cult of Smart. And it actually talks about in the US, the education system, and it poses some pretty interesting and fundamental questions about what do we think education is and what is it we actually want education to do for our children and for society at large? Because historically, people say, of course, more education is always good. Right? Just go to college, go to graduate school, get a professional degree. Uh, and this book actually provides some pretty compelling evidence uh, to think about, uh, is that always good? Right? And because I'd never thought about it that way. So the, the cult of smart uh, is one. And then another one that I had read recently is from the founder of or co-founder of a startup called Bonobos, which was bought by Walmart years Mm. ago. But I thought it would just, it's called Burn Rate. It's Mm. by a guy named Andy Dunn who founded Bonobos. Uh, And I thought, oh boy, this is just going to be about some successful founder who started a company and sold it for hundreds of millions of dollars right? and how great he was. But it was totally not that kind of book. The book instead talks about the journey, yes, but it actually talks about it in the context of mental health. And he's very open about sharing his mental health challenges and how that influenced at a ground level uh, how he was, or in some cases, how he wasn't able to build the company that way he wanted to. I think mental health is an under-discussed topic. And I think it was a really interesting book just precisely for that reason. It comes at it from a different angle of it's not a sun and flowers and sunshine story of how everything was successful, but it's actually a very gritty real world example of Right, uh, some of the amazing things, both good and bad, that happens when you're wrestling uh, with some of these mental health challenges in a high pressure environment. And so it was a very different take. How can my audience find you? LinkedIn? <laughs> yes, uh, yes, LinkedIn is the best. My, if you just search for Arthur Hu and uh, Lenovo, uh, I share regularly about uh, kind of ongoing projects, experiences, and, uh, and business updates. So I'd love to welcome the connection from anyone and, and continuing the dialogue there as well. And for everyone listening out there, you can find us on YouTube and every podcast platform and also subscribe to us and sign up for our newsletter. Art, many thanks for coming on the show and I look forward to speak to you again. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Bernard.